Hello. What's up, friends? Q&A time. Drink some water. Uh, relax. Hung out with the fans. It's time to do some paintings. So feel free to, to ask questions about anything. Anything and everything. Don't be afraid, y'all. Can you guys hear me? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. There you go. Go ahead, man. Uh, can you explain or can you demonstrate how you would do, like, more organic stuff? Like, maybe, like, water or fire or whatever? Oh, <laughs> uh, I see. Um, water, I don't know. I don't paint too much water. So I wouldn't have a really strong... Or even, like, cloth or stuff that kind of just moves freely. Yeah. Fire, uh, I just cheated. I used a lot of gradient maps and stuff. Um, but cloth, I can talk about. So basically, I, I usually just think about how the cloth is hanging from something. And usually I draw like these S's. And then I just kind of have them go back up. And then I draw like another S. I just have these folds go back into themselves. And then once I have something like that, I usually just paint it. And it's just it's just forms. It's just like, what are the forms that I'm painting? Because a lot of times people struggle with their lighting and painting, not because it's they don't understand lighting. Uh, more along the lines of they just don't understand the forms of their painting. So if you can start to see the three-dimensionality of what you're doing, you'll do a much better job. Okay. Yeah, but like, um, it's it's always comes down to like the anatomy of whatever it is that you're drawing. You know, I always say you should learn your anatomy, and I, I usually deliberately mean that for characters, like the actual physical anatomy. It's pretty important. But... Um, I also like to use that term for many other things, like know the anatomy of the actual character design, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, or, I'm sorry, the character design, but like the anatomy of like all the things that make up the character design, that's what I meant to say. So, for mm -hmm. instance, like the cloth and like the metals and stuff like that, like what makes metal metal? What makes cloth cloth? Mm -hmm. and so uh, for me what makes cloth cloth in a lot of ways is just the simplicity of its form um, and then like it's it's pretty standard it's pretty straightforward it's just like whatever it's falling off of is exactly how it's going to be draping usually and then where it starts to get complicated is like the kind of cloth you're dealing with because there's variants of cloth you know they're not all the same and that's, yeah. that's something to take into account. But I paint cloth just like I paint metal, like the same way. It's just I ch challenge it by the reflectiveness, you know, but I, I paint it the same way. Like I just like wrap around the forms, but I just add like a higher specular. And okay. I usually paint like the environment inside of it and something like metal or harder surface oh. hold on my tongue's barking in terms of like the shapes you use what what do you kind of think about or uh the shapes what do you mean uh like if something's kind of like hanging off the side like a piece of cloth like what kind of shapes would you i don't know uh, well, I generally don't focus on shapes uh, on a conscious level. Usually a lot of stuff is subconscious. Um, okay. And a lot of it is driven by what I see, like a lot of what I've experienced. And so I usually tell people, when you want to get better at your shapes, what you got to do is you just got to uh, have a better understanding of, like, what are the examples out there that 
are interesting to you and how you can emulate those same shapes okay. and designs in your work. And you just got to keep practicing it because what I did was I would look at a lot of different cloth and I would look at a lot of different metals and vehicle designs and et cetera, et cetera. I would look at all kinds of things, many different things, you know, and what I would end up doing is once I've done that, I would just start to, um, I would just start to focus in on the patterns that I would see, like what was the things that I saw that were common. Okay. And then I just practiced that often, and then eventually it just became part of my subconscious. And so whenever I'm painting cloth, I, I usually am not thinking too much. I'm just like, okay, you know, it's draping from here. Like, that's as, okay. as far as I think. I don't think beyond that. And it's not because I'm like a magician or anything either. Like I said, like, it's a lot of it has to do with just, I'm just, I've done it so many times. Mm -hmm. So I already have like a pretty good understanding of like what to expect from that material. You know, like if, like uh, you asked me like about water, for instance, that's a good example. Um, because uh, I don't paint water often. So I don't have a really good understanding of it. And so I would have a much harder time painting it. Right. But uh, I have tools to uh, evade this problem. Oh, you know what? I don't, have, I don't want to do this. I want to do something else. I have tools to evade this problem. And those tools are actually relatively simple. And they're the tools that I've been trying to, uh, to teach you guys for the last month, which is study. I just study a lot. Right. All right, so if I need to, like for whatever reason, and it, it could happen and it will probably happen uh, inevitably, like that will be asked to draw um, water again, because I've done it actually a few times. Um, uh, I just do what I do. I just look online, look for reference, find patterns and s systems. And if I was to, to do it often, uh, if I to sneeze, <laughs> if I was to paint water often, you know, that I would uh, make a real effort to to become really good at painting water. And that's what happened. I was working on this project where I was just drawing lots and lots of water. But the problem was is that... Um, uh, it was only for a short amount of time, so that that interest of water just went away. But if I was to get hired again to just do a lot of water designs or whatever, or if I just for whatever reason have some interest in water, uh, I'll just go and learn it and do everything that I've taught you guys. You know, study online. Actually, I want to do another. Keep changing my mind. That's what really happens. This is because I'm talking about. Uh, this concept and uh, you need a lot of my <laughs> cognitive mind going. Yeah, this this should be better. I like where this is going. Um, and so, yeah, for me, it's it's not a matter of like what I think about. It's a matter of whether I want to do something or not. You know what I mean? Or oh, heading yeah. up. See you later. Because if you focus in on like, is AJ like doing one specific thing or is this artist focused doing this one specific thing that I'm not, you're always going to be kind of on a, a search for something that doesn't necessarily exist. I believe a lot of artists who are really good instructors, uh, even the best of them, um, there's, a, there's a pattern to kind of where they got to where they got to. And a lot of that pattern, um, the way that I discovered it, is built around this one premise, which is that they're just really good at whatever they do. So it's never a, a truly secret. Uh, and what you get out of your mentors is not so much the secrets to what they do. Um, what you get out of your mentors, at least what I've discovered over the many years, is you start to just find more evidence of something that you already know within you, which is that it takes just tremendous amounts of efforts and work and, and you just get more evidence of that that that's the case like it's hard to dispute once you start to talk to more artists and you you get more insight from your favorite artists you know you will find out that even if they say yeah you know you got to practice your anatomy you're like okay i gotta practice my anatomy or like you need to work on your materials you yeah, i need to work on my materials you need to understand uh uh, structural drawing. You're, okay, I need to work on structural drawing. Like you need to work on shape design. Okay, you got shape design. I need to work on 
um, anatomy again, in New York anatomy, and then they work on material design, I think material again, really. And then you, and then you got to, what was the thing that I was telling you? Like you got to study uh, materials like water and stuff like that. You got to paint them or you try this. And there's all these little tips and tricks and things uh, that exist. And I, I actually, a lot of my YouTube videos or my Gunroad videos are focused on those types of things because those things mm -hmm. should be a little bit more accessible and cheaper to get because it doesn't guarantee that just because you watch them, you're going to be amazing. Right, as you probably yeah. have noticed. And, but okay. like I said, you'll start to, re like when you start to talk to people like I have, I've talked to countless, countless amounts of artists out there, you know? And I've just come to the conclusion that um, everybody just fucking worked a lot over a long period yeah. of time. And, and so, you know, when it comes to, all this like that's my goal in the class is to truly compound that idea into your mind so there's no shred of doubt and if you're curious to like yeah like i said these nuanced skills that you might see me have like how does aj paint materials the way he does or how does he get that cloth looking so dope um the first trick that i'll tell you is what i showed you right just like you know um understand the anatomy of cloth right which is cloth um drapes from really whatever it's hanging from the tent on the material of the cloth depends on how heavy it is it will affect how it drapes or how it wrinkles right right and uh just practice that become like an expert at cloth and then you'll start to draw on paint cloth more there's a great examples of people who are just experts at something and you can see it in their artwork there's an artist by the name of adon uh he he's a good friend of mine he's really really great kid too he's a young artist um i think he's like probably just turning 20 now and he is super good and uh, i went and saw him talk and he talked about gun design and how and he's like one of the best like gun or practical designers out there and he he went off on a, this whole tangent of like um how when he was a kid he used to build paper guns like guns out of paper because he was so fascinated with weapons and stuff like that you know mm. and he did this like when he was like 16 15 years old so you take something like that and if you try to tell me that he is a prodigy i would say no he just did a lot of stuff right like he he mm. even said like he spent a lot of time in his youth just making contractions one of his favorite shows was like mythbusters and he loved this one episode where they like deconstruct like a sniper rifle or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, that sounds about right. Like that sounds like how people who have a tremendous amount of interest in something become tremendously interested in something, you know? And yeah. uh, he just became really engulfed in this, this world of functionality and design. And uh, I'm, I'm not shocked. That's what I'm trying to get at, like how he got so good at it. And so whenever people are like, how do you get better at gun design? I, I would probably ask, like, have you ever built a paper gun? <laughs> right? And you're like, no. Why is that relevant? Like, well, maybe your lack of interest is evidence to why you, you don't have the skill that you're looking for. Does it mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. Yeah, like, um, let me give you an example, just using you, like how your lack of knowledge um, determines why you're probably having a hard time with cloth. Um, how do you assemble a t-shirt? How do you make a t-shirt? I haven't researched it. <laughs> okay, well, well, how, how do you think? Um, should I just guess? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, it's fine. You don't have to. Okay. <laughs> You're like, oh, good. No. But do you see my point? Yeah. Yeah. Like, do you even know how fabric is made? Not really. Can you name, can you name 10 different fabrics? <laughs> Probably not. You see now how it's just starting to be so um, embarrassingly obvious, right? Like why you have a hard time painting cloth. It's not because you're stupid. It's not because you're talentless, right? 
It's just because you're not knowledgeable. It's just it's always going to be true in things that you you guys are not very good at. Okay. Yeah. Don't ever take it personal, right? Like I think a lot of times artists take it personal. I was asked in a stream the other day, you know, how do you get past um, those days where you just feel like you're not getting any better, right? And I say, well, the fact is I'm always getting better. That's just a fact, regardless of how I feel. Mm -hmm. You know? Like, the way I feel has no correlation to the reality. You know, as long as I'm painting every day, reality is suggesting that I'm going to get better every day, regardless of how I feel. And, and you know, someone's like, well, how do you feel like whenever you're struggling with something that you don't understand? And I said, well, again, I don't take it personal. I don't get frustrated with artistic blocks or growth because I know it's very simple, the reason why I have it. Um, and and I, will, I won't say that I don't ever get frustrated. That's not entirely true. Of course I do. What I'm trying to say is like my frustration doesn't live very long mm -hmm. because I eventually come to my senses and say, oh, well, I just need to learn something. This is like advice I give to you guys, right? And it's not just like advice that I just, uh, it's like the like the Dr. Phil or like uh, the secret, right? The whole secret's around like, if you dream it, it'll be true, right? No, I'm, I'm trying to give you like, this is practical advice. Practical advice is to always side on the, uh, always side on the premise of ignorance, meaning that just assume you just don't know enough. Always assume that you just don't have all the information. You will, you will live in a better state of mind almost all the time. And so many different things. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, for instance, you know, I see a lot of people having overly criticized movies from time and time again in my whole career. In fact, I made a whole video about, good run video about it, like how to kind of stay practical. And one of the, the things, the premises of it, was to, to suggest that um, get the facts. Don't assume that you, you're the almighty know-it-all of all design that makes sense in movies and games. And like, I can tell you why video games or movies are bad. Let me explain it to you in a five-hour rant or something like that, or five-paragraph rant on, on Facebook. Yep. Um, because you might not know. Like, for instance, um, uh, many people know that the Transformers franchise is like a million dollar franchise, a billion dollar franchise. Right? Yeah. But but uh, on Rotten Tomatoes it's got crappy reviews. Yeah. <laughs> so what does that say about it? Right? Did you know this? I just actually discovered this because I was doing some research myself. And I already there's already several movies that I had anticipated that were doing badly on Rotten Tomatoes or did well on Rotten Tomatoes, but did badly in theaters. Uh, Shawshank Redemption. Did you like Shawshank Redemption? I did, yes. It got a 90-something percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And it was a $25 million movie to make. Yeah. And it only made $28 million. Oh, I mean, well. they barely broke even. So... Mm -hmm. Commercially, that's a flop. Yeah. Breaking even is not what you want to do. Breaking even is is actually losing money. And Sorry, what are, you, what are you doing there with the that like line thing? What line thing? Uh, where you're like darkening some parts. Oh, I'm just darkening some parts. I'm not doing anything fancy. Okay. Um, and so a lot of what I'm trying to get at right now, what I'm trying to get across is that um, just assume that you don't know, right? Like if you assume that Rotten Tomatoes, for instance, is the the best news source for movie reviews, um, you're going to be sorely mistaken, right? Mm -hmm. You have to collect evidence. This is how scientists work, right? Scientists work at this capacity where they assume nothing. You know, they make uh, educated guesses, but then they test those results constantly and consistently. And I think a lot of people who are online to make judgment calls do not do this often enough. This is why they run into a lot of different mistakes. And if you start to focus on your weaknesses and your strengths, um, of the knowledge that you have available to you, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll, uh, 
you'll become better and better, faster and faster, instead of just assuming. So that's kind of the moral of the story of what I'm trying to get across. Okay. And so I think, you, you know, when it comes to cloth, just, yeah, just ask yourself some simple questions, like how it's made, like what's the origin of cloth, like what are the different materials that exist, what are the different properties of those materials. Mm-hmm. You know, and I may, I, I don't know every single answer to these questions, but I know more than probably you do, right? This is why I can achieve the results that I achieve. But that's that's the beautiful thing is that you can acquire that same knowledge too, and you can even acquire more than me, become even better than me, which is always a possibility. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I already have lots of students that are just so much better than me, <laughs> which is which is good. It'll be it'll be kind of sucky if my students didn't get any better. Anyway. Good questions. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm trying this new process where I just do a quick design drawing and then I go and try to uh, paint something. There's a lot of freedom that I get from doing this process. It's just I don't feel as comfortable with it. But it goes back to kind of what I was talking about, right? Like, just practice. I'm trying to find other ways to teach people, too. More videos and and things that I can instruct people. The only way I can do that is to kind of learn new things that can help out. Think of all the different ways that I can give people knowledge on how to become better artists. Um, it was oh, asked up in the chat, uh, how do you practice your sense of 3D and sense of perspective? I'm sorry, who, who asked this? Uh, Kevin asked this in the chat. Oh, thank you. How do you practice your sense of 3D? Is that what you're trying to get at? Kevin? Yeah, and sense of perspective is what it says. Oh, thank you, Jessica. Helping out. Appreciate you. Um, yeah, so the practice of your sense of 3D, um, what I usually do is I just do a lot of form paintings. <laughs> you forgot that you asked. <laughs> yeah, just do a lot of form paintings, like paint spheres and cones and three dimensions often. Uh, people don't do that enough. And then also, um, when practicing perspective, try to draw perspective freehand. I, I like to do it on paper. Yeah, just practice it often freehand, and you'll you'll learn to start seeing perspective a little bit better. These are kind of the tools that I used. Okay. I need to start getting some control over this painting. So I'm at the point where I got a lot of cool colors in here. Maybe I can still even change the colors, make it a little bit more interesting to paint. Yeah, but like uh, what I used to do when I had the sketchbook all the time, I used to carry a sketchbook with me when I first started. And I drew in it like every single day. And I would draw these cubes and things in perspective all the time. All the time. And uh, that helped a lot. You got to eat your art vegetables. If you're not drawing a lot of three-dimensional objects or painting three-dimensional objects, you're going to have a hard time painting and drawing three-dimensional objects. Let me ask you, Kevin. Uh, how often do you do form paintings where you're just painting spheres, cones, cylinders, these types of things? Um, I do it sometimes, but probably not enough. Well, it's not a question of do you do it sometimes. I'm asking how often. Uh, I don't know. Once a month, maybe. Okay. So imagine doing anything else for just once a month. 
let's say um, weight training, right? Let's say you go to get into doing deadlifts, right? And once a month you go and do, uh, you know, 20 minutes of deadlifting once a month. Do you believe that your results will be exponential at that pace? Uh, no. Yeah. Do you see kind of the point? Right. So like if you want to get better at 3D painting, right, you got to paint 3D stuff often. You just got to. Okay. Uh, and like I was saying, you know, like what I did was I just painted a lot of spheres and I drew a lot of cubes and just painted a lot of cubes. I did a lot of uh, drawings on my sketchbook, a lot of drawings on my sketchbook, especially for perspective stuff. And I try to do it freehand because if someone told me you should do it more freehand, because it'll, it's going to teach you how to like really understand it, right? And uh, they were right. And I just did it freehand all often. I saw people like Scott Robertson do it freehand, and I was just like, "What in the hell?" And it was like amazing, you know. So ask yourself, yeah, like, do you do it often? Um, because if you're only practicing it on your characters, you're, you're going to run into these problems quite a bit. Like, for instance, try it, like, for this assignment. Just before you start painting more, just do, like, two or three pages of just form studies. And you'll start to reveal to yourself how little you actually know about the forms that you're painting. Does it make sense? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And when you do your form paintings, actually, before you get back to being silent, do you, uh, <laughs> what do you do specifically? Uh, like painting random objects and then just sliding them. Like putting uh, spheres into boxes and just making random shapes and then. Yeah. That sounds about right. Just do more of that. And then what I also would recommend is um, timing yourself and trying to see if you can do it quickly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, just do it more often. You'll see, like, I, I had one student in one class do that, like, for pretty much the whole class because they had, it was very clear to me that their design sensibility was really good, but their sensibilities of rendering and painting were, like, super... Um, like, they had a really hard time just understanding painting and lighting, right? And I just told them, just do keep doing form studies. Keep doing form studies. And that's all I had them do, like, pretty much the whole class, right? And then they got so much better, you know? Uh, should, I try, should I try to do them, like, uh, in color with materials? Nah, see, so that's the problem, right? Like, that's kind of another uh, problem that I see people do. They try to tackle more than one idea to try to practice. Because now you're trying to do color and materials at the same time as just trying to learn your forms. See, it, it, can, be, yeah. it can become a little distracting. Like, just focus only on forms. You know what I mean? Like, until yeah. you start to understand it at a better capacity. And then you can try to just focus on colors and try to understand that until you ha have it on a better capacity. And then try to understand um, color or materials, I mean until you understand that at a better capacity and then try to add two of those things at the same time while you're painting, you know, and then try yeah. to do three. It's like juggling. Like for instance, like I'm coloring and I'm designing and I'm painting values all at the same time. Right. But I've practiced each one of these individually for quite a while, you know? Yeah. But um, then how will I know like when I'm, at a level where I should practice something else. Yeah, so that's that's another good question. And the, the answer to that is you don't. There's not like, it's not like, all right, I've reached level 10 form painting, now moving on to <laughs> colors. You, you'll just organically, I usually tell people, just whatever you feel like you want to learn something new, just go learn something new. But wait until you've learned something first from the previous thing and then move on to the next thing. It might be a, a minor improvement to what you already do, but that's all you need. You don't need major improvements, you know? You just want minor but consistent improvements for 
consecutive days or years, you know? Yeah. Because if you're hoping that there's a point where you, you can see the prize at the end of the rainbow, um, that doesn't ever come. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't, like, it, it's not like one day I was like, bam, I'm good enough now to work for Blizzard Supply, you know? Yeah. I just became, I just, over time, I just became good enough to work for Blizzard. It just happened, right? I applied year after year after year for five years straight, and they never wanted to hire me. And then one day I was like, you know what? I'm done. I don't need Blizzard. And then, <laughs> um, and then they called me like a month later, literally like a month later after me deciding that in my head. So, like, you know, I'm fine with this. I made it. I'm living. I have a good career. You know, I have a, I have a good life. I don't need to work for Blizzard to satisfy my thirst. And uh, then they called me and said, hey, you want to work for the cinematics team? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's what, what I'm trying to get at always in the class is that it is not, unfortunately, it's not easily quantifiable that you're improving, but you are improving every single day. Okay. And so um, if you feel like right now, man, like I feel like my forms are just really garbage. Then work on your forms. And then you're like, man, my anatomy is like really struggling. Then work on your anatomy. And you're like, man, my lighting is like complete dog shit. Then work on your lighting, you know? But yeah. but then when you get to your lighting, you're like, man, my forms are kind of like jacked up. You see what I'm saying? Like, and then you'll start to say, well, let me work on my forms. And then you're like, oh, man, my uh, my anatomy. And then you start working on your anatomy. You're like, oh, my lighting. You see, you keep going in circles. Yeah. But you, you get better every time. Like the the standard of each one is better than the last time you you approached it, makes sense. Yep. And so yeah, there's no uh, unfortunately sorry, there's no like aha moment, <laughs> but there is like a, a good sense of um, or there's a good there's a good and reliable sense of if I just keep at this, I'll achieve success, and you can trust that. You know, it may take time, but you just really got to do uh, as best you can to try to improve on the things that you want to uh, improve upon. Okay. Yeah, man. I have another question as well. Um, yeah, go for it, dude. Like, uh, um, when you start working, do you think it's more valuable to uh, work for, like, a bad company and... Oh, sorry, say that again? Experience. Work for a what company? Like a bad company, like a really small company. That <laughs> oh, no. Don't work for a bad company, no. But, you, uh, like, you used to get experience? Uh, or do no. you think it's more valuable? Because you get bad it? experience. Oh, okay. Like, I work for a... Uh, I, I used to be a plumber. I, I don't have anything that I learned from that other than that, like, real work is sucky. <laughs> you know? I can't use any of that. And it, it, even if you think, hey, you know, I'm still doing art, right? Well, if you're doing, like, web design, like, or graphic arts for, like, websites that has, like, nothing to do with concept art, you know? Or you're doing, like, really bad artwork that you don't even feel that you should put in your portfolio, how does that benefit you? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's actually the opposite. What ends up happening is you start making artwork that you don't like. And you spend a lot of your creative energy doing that. So when you go home, you don't feel like doing any new art. I think Jonathan was experiencing that. I think Jonathan came back too, actually. Maybe Jonathan can talk, <laughs> Jonathan can talk more about that. But like, um... trust me, man, like I, I have seen this happen to many of my friends. And, and uh, a lot of it happened to me in the very beginning of my career. And once I was laid off in my, my first job, that's when I realized never again. Well, less than like that happened. Uh, obviously, if you have to make a living and you got to like survive, that's different, right? But if you're just trying to be like, well, I just want to get a job regardless of the job just so I can get that experience, I'd actually say it's better for you just to remain a student and just keep building your portfolio to the standard that you want it to be and get the jobs that you're actually looking to get. You know, not everybody okay. has that advantage, you know? But if you do, just keep waiting until you start to have like, the work uh, that you are looking to get hired for. Okay. 
But for me, like for instance, I, there's many occasions where I had to work because I had to pay bills, you know. So I get that too. I understand that sentiment. But I'm just trying to say, if you have that advantage of just like I don't really need to work right now, uh, and then don't work yet. Just keep making your portfolio fucking badass, okay? And to the point where you want it to be. And it might take years. But that's fine because once you finally get those first jobs, you're going to be happier. And an experience that you'll get will build upon the portfolio that you already started with. Um, anyway, yeah, Jonathan, you were saying something? I inter- had you um, intervene at some level? My... <laughs> yeah, um, I think my first job wasn't like a terrible studio. Um, I felt like just because it was a game studio, I was getting experience just like having to make optimized art and stuff. Um, but because I didn't really enjoy it there, I also found that like I work really, really hard in the evenings to not have to work there anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know if that's ideal though. Yeah, it's 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 like a double-edged blade, man. That's what I'm trying to get at. Like you want to kind of work. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you want to work. You want to get that experience. But uh, the experience that you get. Um, might be helpful in the future for sure. Like I think, uh, absolutely. Well, I don't think there's any work that you can't like. Even like the plumber example, like I learned something from that, right? Like you're always going to learn something. But trust the hindsight that I'm trying to give you, okay? Which is you don't need to have those experiences. Just trust that experience exists. That's the whole point of like listening to a mentor, right? Is to trust that advice is that perhaps uh, I should take that seriously, like that maybe, you know, the jobs out there just to work, just for the, the sake of working is not the best alternative. Um, I I get this type of insight all the time because I, I've seen it too many times. Like it'll be one thing if it was anecdotal, right? Like if it was my own personal experience and I'm like, you know, well, that's just me though. I don't know about other people, right? No, I've actually talked to countless amounts of artists right and this is almost consecutively true with a lot of these artists is that they started the industry doing just getting a job and it took them decades some of them decades to get out or build a whole new name for themselves you understand me yeah because it's like you do that job and you just get really you just get better at it and you just get better at it and you just get better at it and you just keep getting jobs for that thing like Jonathan, right? Like you're an effects artist, is correct? Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, but I don't think that's what you wanted to be, right? Like you just kind of were wedged into that. Nope. That's my point. <laughs> and then now I'm sure you're really good at it. It's because you um, do it so often. No, apparently, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so people are going to keep hiring you for it, even though that's not necessarily your your soul, like yeah. this, your soul of what you really want to do. So yeah. that's why I always encourage just start off doing what you want to do if it, even if it's hard to do that's the point it just only becomes more harder when you start to work it doesn't it doesn't seem like that's right it doesn't sound intuitive it seems like no if i work I'll, I'll get more time and experience no trust me it's it's uh, there's a name for this that my friend call called it and i thought it was brilliant i can't remember it but i'll tell you what the scenario is is where he was trying to get a he was trying to move from 3d artist to a concept artist internally in blizzard he works there right and he's worked there for five years, and he's one of the best artists. He's beloved by the whole team, right? And he's like, you know, I want to move to concept art. That's what I really enjoy to do. I love designing, you know, more than modeling, right? He's like, but, you know, I just wanted to get a job, and who's going to turn down Blizzard? But he said when he asked for that, they, they, they gave him an, a, an excuse that he never considered why they can't do that for him, why they can't promote him slash move him to a, a different position. And they said to him, "Is like you have to understand that if we move you to concept art, then who's going to take your position? Because you're a badass. You're a rock star. You're like the best 3D modeler we got. So you have to understand that if we take you to, and, and they're like, look, we we understand your your sentiment too. Like you've worked here hard and you're great, but you're like one of the best in the industry that does this thing that we need." Like, the only way this can work out is you can find a replacement, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then and then that became something he didn't reconsider. And I, he had a cool name for that, too. 
yeah and and so <laughs> and so like i i always think about that i'm like huh like if you make yourself an overwhelmingly valuable asset in one field uh and if you're like well you know i worked here long enough like now it's for me to to have my come up things right like to have uh something that i deserve want to work and something that I, I i should have more leverage uh the opposite might actually be true this is why there's a there's a phrase and saying in the industry that if you want to get a raise quit right if you want a promotion quit because that means you have to go to a new job and then you can start fresh you can be like i want like if you start at a studio and say hey you know i want uh like a i want to go from seventy thousand dollars a year to uh eighty thousand dollars a year you know the studio would be like well i don't know right but if you quit and then you get hired at a different studio and the different studio is like, great, we'd love to have you. What's your salary? You'll be like, my salary is 90000 And they're like, cool, we'll do that. You know? And yeah. uh, I know this because my friends do this all the time and I've done it based off of my friend's advice. Right? They say, if you can't get that raise, then you have to leave. <laughs> That's the only way. And there's no offense to the studios that I worked for. I get it. I came in at that rate, and it's going to be hard to all of a sudden just ask for a $10,000 increase in your, your raise, even though you believe you deserve it. Okay? But you can do that starting at a different studio. And I've done that to the point where I'm, I'm, I've been able to now ask for 100000 to $120,000 salaries for working for a studio. But that took like seven years of me doing that, you know? Yeah. And, um, but like I said, I had early on, like my first job, I was a concept artist. That was my initial job. But then I, it was just a job, just to work for a studio. And I ended up doing animations and 3D art and 2D art. I did all, I did everything, you know? And um, I didn't mind. But I realized it wasn't necessarily focused, and then when I got laid off, uh, I had nothing in my portfolio that said anything about what I really wanted to do. So that's when I completely just changed my whole portfolio, you know, to actually have um, some real, um, some real meaning to what I actually love to do. And I just try to educate you guys on that as well. It's the best of my ability, because it's important, man. Thanks. That's very helpful. Yeah. Like, if you have that opportunity to not necessarily have to work just yet, um, you know, focus on your portfolio. Just make it really good. And so that your first shitty job that you get will be a shitty job that will perpetuate your growth. Okay? Because you probably still will end up at a place that might not treat you right. That just is probably more likely to happen especially for those of you who are just starting out, but at least you'll be a concept artist. I had a student that uh, had that problem. They were like, like, should I do environments or should I do this or that? You know, they kept on talking about all the things that they wanted to do, you know, uh, because they said like all these employers keep saying that I need to do this and I need to do that. And I'm like, just do you, boo. <laughs> and like, just very much like I've been telling you guys, right? <clears throat> and uh, he wanted to do characters, so he did kept on doing characters. And then he got this job opportunity, and they're like, "Oh, dude, like we would love for you to do work for us, but you only do characters. Like, is there any other way you can do environments or something like that?" And he came to me, and he's like, "See, like I should have had environments, man." And I'm like, "Yeah, but dude, at the same time, like, you know, you don't like doing environments, you know, and they liked you enough." And I already told him, I was like, your stuff is actually pretty good. Uh, I, I can see why they wanted to hire you in the first place. But you, you just got to stay strong, man. Just stay firm. Stay focused. And uh, he's like, all right, all right. And um, uh, I think a week later, they offered him the job anyway because he was good. <laughs> and so he still ended up doing characters. And he's like, oh, thank you, senpai. And I was like, it's fine. Because it's just facts, man. It's just true. Like, I don't want you guys. I had one student who was just constantly doing graphic design and he's really good at it. And I told him like, um, 
stop doing graphic design in your portfolio if you want to do concept art, bro. You just couldn't get past it. But uh, I think eventually he did change what he wanted to do, and now he's kicking some ass. So, hope that's helpful. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions, friends? Um, as an artist starting out, like, what would you generally apply to? Like, are you just looking at junior artist positions? Because, like, I finished college just back in September. Mm -hmm. so I'm kind of, like, in a limbo of, like, what do I do? Wait, your college didn't tell you how to get a job? Oh, no. No, I, I mean. <laughs> I'm, I'm it, being sarcastic. Just, yeah. Yeah, I know they didn't. Um. They might have told you what you might have needed, but it wasn't good advice. Um, uh, let me tell you. I'll sit down for this one. I'm going to explain it to you very simply. I think I talked about this in previous class you were hanging out in, but I'll say it again. There's only two things you can control. It's how good your artwork is, right? And it's the people that you know. You understand? Yeah. This is like literally the only two things you can control. Um, how good you can make your artwork, which is just the, probably the easiest out of the two to do. Right? It's easier to just keep getting better at your work. It just takes time, but it's easiest because it's just pain, and pain, and pain, and pain. It's harder to make friends, especially if you're super antisocial. You don't seem like you're antisocial, but uh, especially if there's a lot of people who are very heavily introverted. They don't want to go out there and talk to people. But you, people in this position are also fortunate, very fortunate, because they live in the age of the internet. Right? I mean, if a terrorist organization like ISIS can have a Facebook group and have people follow them from all around the world, right? I'm sure you can get people to follow your artwork. <laughs> okay? It's like... It's, it's really that simple. Like, don't be a terrorist active, activist. I'm not saying to say that. I'm just saying, like, something that's so tremendously terrible has their own social network platform, and it's successful, unfortunately, you know? And, and all you got to do is what I've said many times in my class is just post often and constantly and consecutively. That's all you got to do. Even if your work is not as good as you'd like it to be, just post. I used to have a Tumblr. I used to have a blog. I think the blog actually got disconnected. I think that I didn't pay for the IP, and now I lost that one. But, um, yeah, I just had artwork there for, for this old, old artwork that's just been there since, since like, starting that when I first started out, like, about, you know, almost 10 years ago or about 10 years ago. Okay. And I've just been doing that all every day since. Like I've been posting at least once or twice a week on average every day of my whole career, almost, especially in the beginning. My work was bad, but like I posted anyways because I felt like, you know, I needed to cut it out there. I need people to know that I exist. And I slowly built fans on my blog. I got like a thousand people to follow my blog. And that was, that was a big deal back in the day, like a thousand people like on an art blog, like an obscured art blog, you know? And I was like, man, I'm really killing it. And all I did was post often. And then I switched over to Facebook. I don't know what made me decide to start posting artwork on Facebook. I was like, I'm going to start posting on Facebook instead. And I started doing that. And I was like, man, Facebook is like kink. And I just started posting there all the time. And what ended up happening is over many years, I just got better. Like I told you, right? You're just consecutively drawing. You're just going to get better. You know, it's going to be hard to, to stop that train, you know? But I also built a huge fan base. Now I'm um, leaning up to 35,000 followers on my Facebook profile. I have up to, to almost 25 followers on my Facebook page, um, which is probably most of the same followers, right? And I almost have 80,000 on my Instagram and I, I just got 20,000 today 
on my art station. And all I did, and I've talked about this before, post often. And so this is an introvert solution because you don't have to talk to anybody. You get it? Like you just post your shit everywhere. Uh, I'm starting to get back onto DeviantArt. I'm having John help me out with that. Right? I'm starting to post stuff on YouTube. I'm starting to do my streams again now that I've gotten that time back and I've started structuring my days a little bit differently. Right? But I talked about it earlier this morning, but I'm starting to get flus like uh, flustered again, so I need to kind of like take a, take a step back and try to make sure I don't fall in the same trap that I fell into the, uh, two years ago. <clears throat> but if you're a social person too, which I am, I'm very social. I like to talk to people. I like to help people. As long as you're not a jerk off, you'll make a lot of friends in this industry. And I say friends, make friends because friends implies that they like you too, right? That the, 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 the agreement between your guys' relationship is mutual agreement, right? That's what a friendship, a real friendship is. Meaning that I am your friend, not because I can get something out of you. I'm your friend because I genuinely like you as a person. You're a cool person and I want to hang out with you. And vice versa. And it's important because that then includes, you know, students, classmates, people that are just trying to start out. If you treat everybody the same and consistently, You'll build a really good reputation all throughout. The industry is very small. You understand me? So if you treat art directors like they're um, gods and you do everything that they ask you to do, or artists that you truly admire, um, but then you treat like your fellow classmates like whatever, scrubs, um, I'm going to warn you that's terrible strategies. For one, what if the art directors are complete dickheads? Then if let's say you do get that job, you're gonna work for a dickhead now. Which is which is totally possible. And and if you treat your classmates, which I don't think anyone here does, and I'm just making this advice more broadly, so you guys can compound what you guys probably already know. But if you treat your classmates like, well, whatever, you know, so and so is not so good. Like Je Jessica's not so good today, so I'm not gonna like hang out with her often. Right? Oh no. <laughs> But guess what? Jessica will one day become a badass and maybe an art director. It's just inevitable. If you keep it at if you keep at it, Jessica, you will be great, right? And same thing with your peers, everyone in this class, everybody on the Discord. You understand me? You, you hear what I'm getting at? So if you just are friends with people, not because of the merit of how good their artwork is, but just on the merit of who they are, <laughs> then and then when, when these people become badasses, like, guess what? Friends want to work with friends. You hear me? Yeah. And so the school doesn't teach you this shit. The school says, like, you just got to have a resume and a cover letter, and you got to graduate, and you got to do all this stuff. Like, nobody cares about that stuff, man. Like, I got hired 90% of the time because I knew the people that were hiring me. 90% of the time. And then the other 10% of the time was either I applied for a job, which was very, like, only, I think, one job that I ever applied for I got, okay? But the the many other opportunities that live in that 10% were just because I had my artwork out there and people found it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My college, I just did, like, a one-year entry art level program and then I didn't do any more at the college because I was like it's kind of a waste of my time good most of them are not all of them but most of them are, are not very useful I usually encourage people to to be very attentive to this I'm not one to advocate dropping out but I advocate dropping out <laughs> I might one of my teachers at my art institute he told me to drop out it was awesome he was one of my favorite teachers too he, he's him and i were sitting in class and i was like you know man i'm really in like struggling here man like i'm trying to do some good work but in some of my classes the teachers don't give a fuck and they just like keep telling me to stop drawing and work on the whatever they're making me do 
I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm in an art school, and I feel like I need to do art. And then these people are like, no, don't do art. Do this. And I'm like, what? I thought I was going to art school, homie. And um, he said to me, he's like, you know, um, so between me and you and the walls, he's like, there's nothing else for here. you here. Like, the school has nothing else left to offer. Like, you've got, you've reached the limits. And I'm like, what? Like, this is, like, the teacher of one of the, the school. And he was like, yeah, man, like, like the, the, the educational system built into place is not made for people like you. It's made for people that um, are complacent, to people that just want the easy solution to getting the opportunities, right? And unfortunate for those people, it's a lie. Not everybody's going to get their break, even if you graduate. And I was like, damn, that's some real shit. He was like, yeah. And so I dropped out, like, I think a month later. And then all my friends who graduated, and I told them this stuff, too. I was like, dude, uh, so-and-so said this. And I'm like, you should trust me on this. And then they're like, nah, but, you know, I'm almost, I'm so close. You know, make sure I get that. It's like, I just got one more year. I'll get it. And, you know, you never know when you need it, the diploma. And I was like, but this dude, like, one of our favorite teachers said this to me. Like, I'm not making this shit up. And they're like, yeah, I believe you. Like, but it's just, you know, I want to make sure. And uh, out of all my friends, I turned out the most successful. And I, I still do not have a, a college diploma. Same, dude. Yeah. So keep that in mind, y'all. Education is highly recommended. I think education there's no question that I believe in education. That's what I, I do for a living. But what I'm trying to make a point of is that not all education institutes are made equal. You're paying a lot of money for promises that might not be kept. They're making unyieldly promises. So uh, to hopefully to answer your question, like, what do you do? You got to just keep doing what you're doing. And you got to go to these events. There's an event near you. A three-hour drive, which is edge control. You should go. Meet a okay. lot of your fellow Canadians. In fact, I could probably, just as a favor to you, because you, you're, I know you're a super hard worker, um, I'll talk to Denzel and Zabby, the guys who run that show, and see if I can get you a free ticket. So then all you have to do is just find a place to hang out and just get down there. Oh, my God. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, you're welcome. So then you have no fucking excuses. <laughs> so, okay. AJ hooked me up, and, you know, he's giving me some sound advice. I should try to take it seriously. And I think you will. I mean, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I'm sure you're going to love it. You're going you're gonna to see what I'm talking about when you go and meet these people in real life. You're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. And, you know, if you guys are uh, anyone else near Ca Toronto... I'll hook you guys up as well. Uh, I think uh, two of Brennan? the other guys in this class. Yeah, uh, someone here is Toronto. Brennan. <laughs> Brennan, who else? Someone here is in Montreal, I think. I can't remember who. Montreal. Nope. We don't like the Montreals. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is only for uh, people close to Toronto. <laughs> Yeah, of course. I'll, I'll set it up. Wait, is it in Toronto? It's in Toronto, yes. What's it called? Edge Control. So, like, uh, I had Denzel and Zabby in my class, and they would always complain. They'd be like, man, like, California has all these great events and stuff, and, like, you know, uh, we don't have anything out here, and it sucks. Like, I wish there was more stuff out here for people like us, like local, right? And I was like, why don't you guys just make your own? And they're like, what? And I was like, yeah, why, why are you waiting for other people to make this happen? Why can't you guys make this happen? And they're like, well, like, it's probably just, like, really expensive, or we don't know where to get the venues and all that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, sure. But just look into it. You might find out it's not as bad as you might think. And they're like, huh, all right. And so then they looked into it, and they're like, hey, hey, senpai, it's not as bad as we thought. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you're right. 
<laughs> and I was like, I'll help you guys. We'll, we'll make this a success. We'll work together. And then they made it a complete success. It, it turned out great. I think they just broke even on the event enough to show them that they can do it again. Everyone that turned out loved it. Everyone was like, I can't believe that they made this happen. It's insane. And they like, they brought these artists from, um, from uh, California and they work in these industries that we would love to work for. And, uh, People turned out like crazy. We had like a lot of fun hanging out in the city and stuff like that, and it was great, you know. And uh, now they're doing another one this year, and it's all on them. Like I didn't, I'm not involved in it in any way, other than like I love those guys, right? But uh, yeah, they're they're really really good people. And I told them that they can do it, and they made their own community. And once they did that, the, there was Crush Visual, who they're local over there in Toronto, right? They're local um, peeps down there. And these people are uh, are some of the bad, baddest, like most badass people in the industry that live in Toronto. They went to this event, and they're just like, holy smokes, you know? Like... Like, there's a large community here, and that's when they decided to build Talent Tree, their school out there, and they're slowly building it, which is I read my freak. And uh, me and Frank talk often. I try to help him out, give him some advice on how to make the school successful down there. But you see kind of what I'm getting at? Like, community is very strong. And if you just make an effort to go and hang out and even make your own communities, um, you can make a big difference, seriously, to your own career and to others. So don't always wait around. Like, wait, don't wait for other people to make things happen. You, you got to make it on your own. I always tell, like, I, I'm a very progressive thinker in terms of, like, you know, equal rights and opportunities, right, and and social programs that help everyone that are reasonable, like, you know, healthcare for all type stuff. Um, but I'm very conservative when it comes to uh, business and working work ethic, you know. I and I think most reasonable progressives think the same way as I do. This is why I consider myself an independent, which is that uh, I don't think everybody should just get a participation badge just for participating. You understand? Like just because you go to college doesn't mean you're guaranteed a job. You have to earn it. But that is the result of what you do with your education is different than do you have access to that education, right? And that's what I believe. And I believe that everybody should have access to great education and ability of knowledge and workshops and events uh, at at a low cost. It should be free, if, uh, if anything, um, low cost entry. Like, you guys should only be paying me nothing to join my classes. The, your guys' government should pay me, you know? But what you do with that time that you have in my class and the things that you've learned is then up to you whether you do something with it, right? So then it works out for everybody. I get paid because your government funds it and then um, – or my government funds it. Or uh, you basically pay me a marginal cost. Like I said, $500, maybe 50 bucks, And then the, the rest of the government pays the subsidies, pays for the rest. Right, reimburses you or something. Like maybe you do pay five hundred, and then the government reimburses you later. I don't know. That's that's what I believe should happen. But just because you take my class doesn't mean I won't be like, all right, now here's a job. Right, I'm just gonna get make you prepared, and that's what I believe in. And I think these events and stuff um, are becoming more and more affordable. Even my class at a at a price tag of five hundred dollars is actually relatively cheap for what you get especially in instances where I've had students tell me that they went to school for three years and they learned more from my class in one month. And those three years of school did not cost $500. And I, that makes me very happy to hear. But it also makes me very sad because it's like people paying 20, 30, 40, 60, $100,000 for this education that they think is going to give them the knowledge that they need um, really dis disheartens me. But getting back to the topic, though, the advice I'm trying to give you, uh, focus on making better work and just networking and making friends. I like to say make friends, not so much networking. Networking sounds a little um, 
it's it's it is what you're doing, right? You're totally networking. But networking seems like um like something like an HR representative would say, you know? It's the perception that word I don't like, even though the little the little the literal term is correct. Like you are just making connections with people that have value to you. But if you don't look at it that way, if you just say, I'm going to make friends with this person regardless of their position because I think they're really cool people, uh, you should just live by that standard. So that way you can, whenever you're, you're um, put in a position where you're, what you call it, uh, in a dilemma where you meet your idol and they're a total dickhead to you, you'd be like, I remember that AJ told me that it's fine. Like, to not be their friends. <laughs> you, it's pretty, it seems pretty obvious, you know? Like, I think most of you guys can understand that on a, a very obvious sense, like in, in a closed experiment or thought experiment. But some of you guys will be in that position and might not know what to do. Okay? So now I'm telling you what to do. Just ignore them and just know that it's fine. Your dreams have been, cre or your, your, your perceptions of them have been shattered. It's fine. Move on. And you can still like their art, even if you don't appreciate them as a person anymore. Oh, that's true for me. With not a lot of artists, actually. There's, I don't think there's too many artists that I've met that are like that. I've, like, out of 100%, 99.9999999% of the people I've met are awesome. But that 0.01% of people... Um, not so awesome. It happens. That's like I said, like, uh, you can, if you just keep painting and drawing, you'll be good, right? Regardless. Uh, and regardless if you're an asshole. <laughs> yeah. Regardless if you're a kind person or you're an asshole, if you just draw all the time, you'll be good. Good. doesn't matter. <clears throat> being an asshole does not prevent you from being, having a badass concept artist. And so, um, like, real life is not like the movies. You know, bad guys win all the time, too. Okay? And so, one thing that I will uh, kind of say, and I have to get going soon, uh, one piece of advice that I would just generally say is that if you focus on those two things, you guys will do relatively well. I believe that most of the students in my class are destined to be great because you guys, again, spend the time and effort to work hard for my class and try to put the the effort to become better artists for yourself. And that says a lot about who you are. So take that very seriously. Not that many people do a lot of what you guys do. And that's why I'm very proud to say that a good percentage of my students are working now. I'm working in, on cool projects. And uh, a lot of them are going to work on bigger and better projects uh, with just more time. And I'm looking forward to it. I think I have two more years. I said like a year ago that a lot of my students will be in the industry. And that's already happening. I think one more year a lot more going to be in there and it's always going to be perpetually um, happen. So like you guys, I imagine most of you guys within the next two to three years will be working and doing stuff that you guys really appreciate. So keep at it. All right. Actually, I'll take one last question. If there's any last questions before I roll out. Um, does anyone else have anything? Or can I? Just go for it. Okay. You don't have to ask anyone else. Uh, so what was it like working at Blizzard? Like, what, what did you do, like, every day, whatever? Just concepts every day. <laughs> just, just like what you imagine, like, pretty much what you guys are doing in my class. Like, I would get an assignment, and I would just do tons of thumbnails or iterations until my art director approved of any. That's pretty much how it worked. Seriously, it's pretty similar. Nothing shocking. And that's the thing. I think people are hoping that when they work for these larger companies that it's going to be like this weird utopia of like concept art fun every single day. No, it's work. It's work. Right? Like it's the same thing. That's why if you can't enjoy doing personal work, uh, you're going to have a hard time working for other people. You know? okay. um, but uh, for me, uh, outside of like the obvious work stuff, it was just fun because I was always surrounded by a lot of like-minded people, which is really nice. You know, the conversations we've had were always really strong and very constructive. And um, like, and that's like outside of work. That's just like talking to people, like going to desks, mm -hmm. just having fun conversations about art or just the industry or movies, game design, 
you know, these because these people are highly elite artists or um, employees as well, right? So you would have these really worthwhile conversations. Um, right. But you don't have to work for Blizzard to have these conversations with these people. That's the, kind of the thing, you know? Like you can just talk to them online sometimes. Some of these people are, are available, <laughs> you know? And uh, like you guys talk to me, for instance, right? Right. <laughs> and so then, uh, you know, that's kind of thing, but it, it's it's more convenient, obviously, if you can just like every day see these people and go to their desks and just see what they're working on, what no one else will see for years, right? That's always really cool. That that to me is like the greatest part about working in development is seeing stuff that nobody will ever see until like potentially never see, uh, because the artist can refuse to show it if they like, you know, and only mm-hmm. see the final product, the version of the final product based off of the concepts or whatever. And so that's kind of the the coolest things. Um, that was my favorite part. But you know, again, it had nothing to do with like the actual work that I was doing. Like I loved working on StarCraft. It was fun. It was a dream come true type of thing. But it's just a, a dream. Sometimes you, you still have to wake up from them, right? And I woke up yeah. and I was like, well, that's like not fulfilling entirely for me specifically. Some other people have felt mm-hmm. differently. And so it was just again just work. And so I was just like, hmm. I need to read this, define what I think is my vocation. And so that's what I did. And that's what I do now. I teach and I make stuff. That's what I love. And so uh, my point to you is that, you know, if you, if you're thinking that there's like some sort of weird upside to working for a company, those are the upsides, just being surrounded by great people, working on great projects, but it's still the same thing that you do for my class. It's nothing uniquely different. Um, there might be nuances, and there there is absolutely differences, you know. Sometimes they're going to ask for only thumbnails, sketches. Sometimes they'll ask for full renders, you know. These types of things, you know, like that that changes depending on who you work for. So there's never an answer for all. That's why I have you guys do thumbnails to final paintings, because that means you have a broad skill set, okay? Right. <clears throat> but um, ironically, like I said, like what I enjoyed about working for studios almost had nothing to do with the work though. It always had to do with the people I worked with. So there was occasions where I worked for really big projects that I hated the people I worked with. Hate's a strong word. I just didn't like them as much as I liked working for smaller studios where we were just like playing chess in the middle of the day for fun, just hanging out and talking shit, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that to me was so much better. And I enjoyed that environment more than I did just like working on large companies where their HR com- departments that told you not to say shit like that, you know, where you had to be politically correct for obvious and good reasons. But when you're looking at a small studio with a bunch of uh, weirdos, it's a lot more fun and like <laughs> like-minded weirdos, you know? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I mean, like even at Blizzard, my, the people that I worked with directly, I didn't enjoy their company as much as I enjoyed like people from a different department. There were people that worked in a while because I worked out with those guys right. and we would have more of like a friendship, like a kin of friendship when we hung out because, you know, we just got along better, but we weren't working on the same team. We weren't working on the same project. You know, we were in different fields, even like they were environment prop artists. Mm. Right. And I was like a cinematic concept artist. But I just saw them as my close friends. Like, they're a lot of fun to hang out with and work out with. Yeah. You know? And then even though I was right across from someone like Mateus, who was, like, one of the best concept artists in the industry, now art director, you know, we the we didn't click as much as I did with those guys. Not to say that we're not good friends. I just was better friends with those guys. Mm. So, again, like, just because you end up working with people that are amazing doesn't, again, mean you're going to get along like you would think. Yeah. Like, and like I said, I don't, um, it doesn't mean that those people that I work with, I, I wasn't super close friends with. It's, that's, that's not what I'm trying to get at. I'm just saying I am close friends with those people, but there are people that are obviously more, I'm more attracted to, you know? Yeah. And uh, that's, that happens almost all the time. It's funny. Cause like uh, the same thing kind of happened at Sony that I was actually more, uh, in a fun relationship with the modelers because those guys are just really funny guys and we just crack up all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I would go to lunch with those guys more than I did with the concept crew. 
but I got along with the concept crew too. I got along with two of the, the concept artists there. They were like a lot, of, a lot of fun too, but they would always like go out and do other stuff during lunch. So then I ended up hanging out with like the modelers because I don't discriminate, right? I'm not like, oh, I'm concept artist. I'm top tier. No, we're all one big machine and we're just cogs in the machine. You know, mm-hmm. that's how I always thought it. Like if, like if, if I, if you only relied on concepts, nothing could be made, right? Like, because the concept is just to pass on to the next group of people that are going to make it. So, yeah. if, like, if you have a game that is, if you have a game studio that's primarily only concept artists, the only thing you can do is outsource visual ideas. That's it. So I understood that importance, even though it seemed like what I did was like glorious, you know, in the eyes of the modelers. I knew that without them, um, it didn't matter, right? Mm-hmm. Without the programmers, it didn't matter. Without the animators and riggers, it didn't matter. Without the tech artists, it didn't matter. And so I just befriended anybody, uh, everybody that I talked to, ran into. I talked to tech artists all the time. I talked to programmers all the time because I was just interested in their jobs and what they did. And so that could help me be better, a better concept artist for them. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't just shooting pie in the sky concepts that they can never make, you know, which I still did. But, uh, but my, the closing thoughts that I'm trying to throw at you is that working for big or small studios is, is great. And you should try as many as you can, if you can. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, like, again, focus on what you can control, which is the work that you make and yep. the people that you know, because you will then work on the kinds of projects that you want to work on and, uh, work with people that you would love to work with. Mm-hmm. And that's the best solution, right? Working on projects that you love with the people that you love. Mm-hmm. And the best way to do that is to have work that f- focuses on the things you love and making friendships with the people that you love. Got it? Yeah. And that's what I've Thank done. You. Yeah, that's what I've done, and it's worked out great. All right, guys. I'm going to go now. Peace out. This is the last class, uh, I mean, this is the last week we're going into. So please, please, please push yourself to the best of your ability. Try to come out of this guns blazing. I usually give you guys one more week after the class to just work on your skills and push yourself even further. But with that being said, hang out in the discords, hang out in the Skype chat, do what you can to keep each other motivated. And uh, I'll talk to you guys next week. Later. Have a great weekend. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.